next, Amin Rafi on decentralized governance and privacy. Thanks, Thank you man. Very much. Big so, round of applause. Welcome, everyone. My name is Amin. Uh, I'll put it on the slide that tells you a bit about me. So some words that describe who I am. Uh, so I've been involved since 2013. My background varies greatly depending on what I'm interested in. So I started off, I guess, as a person on Bitcoin talk, reading all the articles, learning about the movement. And then Dogecoin came out. That was fun. Went through all of that. Coin, yeah, coin was there. I was a big part of that too. That was fun too. Uh, so some of you that know, I guess, the history of it, know what those uh, mean and what the significance of them are. From there, I started working as a journalist. I started getting involved with various projects that aligned with what I believed decentralization was leading to or in how it should be portrayed uh, in a project. Thereafter, I got involved with BitNation, which would probably be one of the first to attempt to decentralize governance services. So for me, that was a very heavy point of my life because not only did it involve decentralization, it also had touches of government-based and society-based protocols that needed to be decentralized. So I became one of the co-founders of BitNation. I was involved for about three years. It gave me a lot of experience on how governments uh, function, on how the tools can be decentralized, what the limitations of doing so would lead to, and also opportunities that exist for other services to come and be involved. So back then, there was no reputation system. There was no you know, dispute resolution system that you kind of see commonly throughout various projects now. Limitations of doing so would lead to and also opportunities that exist for other services to come and be involved. So back then, there was no reputation system. There was no you know, dispute resolution system that you kind of see commonly throughout various projects now. So one of the key uh, components or elements within decentralization is the need to have a reputation system. Without it, you kind of go down a slippery slope where this entire system can be gamified and lead to very uh, negative results. So reputation systems are very, very important. They sit at the heart of most decentralized systems, whether you like to look at it or not. So the example that was on before where you vote, that's sort of a reputation system. Uh, the other aspect which is very important is how decisions are made. So not only is it important that we have a protocol that allows reputation, but also how do we make decisions in a decentralized way. And that's very, very important. And many protocols have attempted to resolve that through various wins, uh, whether it's through, for example, Dash's masternode, putting your skin in the game, and therefore I have a right to suggest something. Uh, and there's many other protocols such as Aragon, Decred, which I will kind of mention and go over as well. But to kind of break it down, those are the two main aspects, reputation system and decision making, which we will uh, from now on refer to as the governance system. The other parts which are also important is funding. So if you have a decentralized system, let's say called Bitcoin, it doesn't make much sense if you bring outside influence into the paradigm. So in the case of Bitcoin, the problem is that we need outside investors to fund the development and other aspects that may be required for that project. Now, this is great as a first step because Bitcoin, but the limitations exist because now we need Blockstream to fund the developers. And I'm not here to question the integrity of individuals, organizations involved. I'm just saying it could be designed in a way where we don't need to have outside investors involved, where the decisions and the funding comes com completely from the network itself. It makes sense, sounds easy, it's hard to implement, it's even harder to manage. So I guess over the years I've been trying to find out who's doing it which way, what's working, or find limitations, going to their community and trying to break the system. Um, Habitually, I enjoy that because that allows them to have a better oversight on what needs to be changed or modified for future uh, development. So to bring it up, firstly, two questions. How many of you know the Zapatista community in Mexico? Okay, one person. And yet you're all into decentralization. Um, I'm, not, I'm not being a dick. I'm just asking. Maybe a bit. Um, the second question is, how many of you know Timor Leste and the decentralization initiative being uh, kind of pushed there since 2004, I believe? None of you. Cool. This is great. 
We're going to learn about real life uh, applications of uh, decentralization. So I don't have the slides on them. It's irrelevant for me. Um, I'm here more to talk to you all. So Timor Leste was given $8 billion over a period of eight years to reduce poverty. Poverty is a huge problem within Timor Leste. It's a region near Indonesia, in case you don't know where it is. Uh, poverty doubled after, after that period, despite $8 billion being given to the region. It's, it's not rocket science. Accountability accounts for a lot of this. I mean, you can look at IMF and the effect they've had within African regions and the terrible effect that has had. Instead of doing better, it does worse. Why? Because the moment you bring aid into a country, you're taking away the responsibility to manage their resources. You're taking away the responsibility to do something about it. You're saying, hey, it's OK, here's some money. And in a lot of times, these countries are quite poor. So people get into those, uh, let's say, roles of being a politician or high uh, decision-making roles because the money then comes to them. They get to. Yeah, if sure. If anybody's not comfortable with pictures being taken, please let me know and I'll make sure that Respect. we manage pictures. So, as we're going to talk about privacy, so. <laughs> no, no, it's OK. No problem? No problem. No problem. All right, cheers. Right. Right. So <laughs> uh, I'll get to privacy in a sec as well. But we'll start off with this. So Timor Leste, this, this happens. And this happens in a lot of uh, countries where corruption is quite high. Transparency is quite low, accountability is quite low, and in more, uh, more often than not, uh, these countries have positions that favor people to go into that, let's say, political role to get money. Um, so we have this uh, vicious circle where money comes in, you don't know where it went, you kind of do, there's corrupt uh, politicians involved, it doesn't do the country any good. At the same time, you're enabling them. Uh, by providing such a system instead of working with them to figure out how to develop it. So one of the main powers of decentralization for me is the ability to go bottom up. So bottom up would be me coming to your house and going, hey, what, and going, hey, what would you like different to, the, your, to be done in, in, within your environment? This is your house. You know what's best for you. These are your kids. You know what's best for them. Top down is the traditional way where I come and go, hey, man, I studied at Oxford. I know what's best for your house. And you'd be like, yeah, cool, but this isn't Oxford. This isn't in some textbook. This is my family. This is my community. And they, we work differently. I mean, key point there would be, for example, Afghanistan. US went in, took a lot of Harvard business studied individuals who were like, we know how to run this. We've studied it from Ivy League school. And it did terrible things. Because you don't know as an individual what's good for another person especially if you don't know their culture, you don't know their tradition. Bribing might be a part of that. In your mind, you're like, bribing is not OK. I studied it in hardware. They call it uh, you know, corruption. So there's a lot of mismatch input. There's a, mis a lot of, uh, I guess, enabling of certain behaviors or things. So that's Timor Leste. Let's now speak about the Zapatistas. Zapatistas, I do have a slide. Blah, 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 blah. So with the Zapatistas, they're situated in Mexico, and it started in 1994. There. So it started in 1994 as an indigenous movement to preserve local traditions and cultures, in specific the Mayans. Uh, they were not getting much support from the neoliberalist, let's say, uh, Mexican government. So this started as a very agricultural-based kind of movement where people you know, took, the, to, to, took it to themselves to protect their way of life, to want to disconnect themselves from the Mexican government. This is one of the most successful attempts of decentralizing themselves from the Mexican government. This is one of the most successful attempts of decentralization of autonomous regions in the world. And yet, most places I go to, people don't know about it. I didn't even know about it until about a year ago. So we're on the same boat. Um, but yet, it contains 150 to 300,000 individuals. That's powerful. The model could be taken and applied into many regions where uh, indigenous cultures or certain traditions or cultures are at harm's way. For example, the Kurdish in the Middle East. That could be applied to it, allowing them to produce their own, let's say in this region, they produce their own coffee, their own chocolate, their own honey, their own tobacco, fruits and vegetables. They turn over hundreds of millions of dollars per year in their own autonomous economy. 
They receive no aid from the Mexican government, whether it's from education, medical, uh, finance, uh, and many other sectors. They are fully autonomous. There is no power grid going into their zones. They are cut off. So that is the complete turn. They have taken it into their own hands to create such a system, and it's quite successful, in, if you ask me, whatever that counts for. So you can go there, and there's a university. So I went to the university in San Cristobal, which is in Chiapas, and it was fascinating. So Noam Chomsky regarded it as a very holistic university. And if Noam Chomsky regards it as something positive, I definitely will look into it. So I went and visited it. So on Thursdays around 6 or 7 p.m., you can kind of go in and like get a tour. And the moment you step in, you see it's very different. So it's got the fences outside. And then once you're inside, they have their own generator. So this produces the entire, I guess, the power for the entire complex or structure, let's say. Uh, Within it, you can see it's very colorful, right? It's like a beautiful you know, typewriting, uh, many functional skills. You can go there and learn. And I was very surprised by it. You can go participate in it. Indigenous kids that don't even speak Spanish can go and participate in it. And that for me, again, was very fascinating that there's people and regions within Mexico that Spanish doesn't exist in. Uh, for me, the British, I guess, attempt at wiping out cultures never left many individuals to regain or have some sort of identity left. But fortunately, this didn't occur in uh, Mexico. And there's people who would be speaking. And I said, well, you don't sound like you're speaking Spanish. What language are you speaking? And they would say, well, I'm speaking Mayan. And for me, it was mind blowing. Like the fact that there was regions where the guy had to translate to his wife what I was saying to him in Spanish. And that for me was very, very uh, yeah, eye opening. So that's the university, you can go there and they do things themselves, autonomous. In fact, their hospital services are so good that sometimes when people get sick within the normal Mexican regions, they are sent there because they have better facilities. Um, that speaks for itself. So when you have autonomy, when you have some sort of, I guess, uh, they don't have a hierarchy uh, model either. So they make decisions as a community. Uh, there's no top-down hierarchy model. Uh, it's a flat model, let's say. And uh, it's in the best interest of everyone to participate, discuss things, and implement ideas or progress together. So me, for me, these two examples, Timor Leste, where, where they have implied, uh, applied decentralization, so resources and funds are raised from a bottom-up uh, perspective. So people who are actually involved with those regions make decisions about those regions rather than some guy sitting in an office that was never there or probably will never visit. So we're trying to change through decentralization, whether it's governance or cryptocurrencies or many other of these protocols, governance or cryptocurrencies or many other of these protocols, the fact that you do it bottom up. So for example, you submitted a proposal, people see it, people who have skin in the game, meaning that individuals that vote on it have a stake in that system, which is provided by the cryptocurrency. Therefore, they have the ability to vote on that. By doing so, you ensure that the people choosing to implement or comment on certain things that affect their ecosystem are a part of that system. So let's modify this a bit. If you have read the book, Skin in the Game, it speaks about this quite a lot, where only those who do should talk, I mean, those who do should talk, and only those who do should talk. So it's a very simple matter. If you don't know, I'll do it, I'll do it. It's just a change in slide. Um, so if, you, if you're in a region, or if you're part of a project and you're giving opinions and you don't have a stake within that project, for me, your opinion is worthless. It doesn't count because if I'm not a doctor, I can't make comments as a doctor. If my life or my financial health is not put at risk for my decisions, they are to some degree worthless. So before I go tell people, hey, do cold showers, I better ensure that I'm doing it. Before I go tell people, hey, being a vegetarian might be a better option, I better ensure that I'm doing it. It's not that hard to figure these things out. So if you take it back in time, Skin in the Game speaks about this a lot, where emperors used to ride with their soldiers in the front. You know, it wasn't the case like, yeah, go guys, I'll just do the paperwork, you know? No, like they rode in the front and battled with their soldiers. Their skin was as much in the game as any other person. Their decisions would affect their livelihood as much as their soldiers. This was a fine balance because your error meant that you died and then someone else it's very healthy, in my opinion, to do this. The pilot, for example, as mentioned in the book, makes sure that you check the systems of the airplane because chances are, whether you like to check it or not, you're in the plane as well. And if the thing goes down, you're going down with it. 
Skin in the game automatically allows you to be a participant within a network or let's say a project or a task, but at the same time ensures that your errors are paid for also by you. So when you have the, for example, a governance system where the president or the politicians do not have to suffer for decisions being made, automatically we can assume that this is going to lead to a cropped environment. It's not that hard to figure out. So for example, if Bush said, let's go to war, sure, mate, send your you know, nephews and sons on the first march, and we'll call it even. But if you're not going to do that, maybe you shouldn't say such things. And these things automatically allow people to reconsider. Be like, all right, let's send the soldiers. Oh, my son has to come. Maybe we'll chill it out for a few months. You know what I mean? So if we implement ideas that automatically includes people and distributes the risk to these people, or even AI or other components that will be involved in the future, you automatically reduce the amount of risk that's involved. And that's what we want to do. Me, as a product designer, it's all about input-output. So if you give me a system, I need to know how information is coming in and how much risk is involved in that and how many people have to suffer for me to have that information or that you know, pathway, and then the way it's going out. I need to know where it's going, how it's going, and what information, again, is being collected. My number one job would be to minimize both ends, to make sure minimal damage and minimal risk is involved in both. So that's kind of an overview of how I feel about governance and how skin in the game changes things. So now to on how skin in the game changes things. So now to give you, I guess, some examples, um, as I said, with BitNation, I kind of explored these ideas. So birth certificate, marriage certificate, land registration. These were fascinating. Ethereum was an unknown entity back then. Uh, and they were attempting to do a lot of these things. We have now seen the evolution of that and the existence of many decentralized autonomous organizations. And these have opened the door to things that we have never had before. These things have never existed before. So there's a lot of questions. Which governance system is the best? You know, is Aragon's the best? Is Claros the best? Is you know, what was DAO stack the best? Uh, we don't know. Is there a best? No, there is no best. You know, what I mean, like we need to detach from that word and then look at it as like what applies to what function. So, for example, for me, Aragon is a great example on how you can create a, uh, let's say, corporate entity or autonomous entity, distribute shares, hold, uh, let's say, voting and uh, distribution of uh, addition of new members, let's say. These are very powerful things we can do with Aragon, and they're doing great. Not only are they doing great, but you can also go to transparency.aragon, uh, you know, the hyperlink, and see how they are functioning themselves. They put skin in the game. So they didn't say, hey, let's create transparency for all these organizations, but we're not going to do it ourselves and not show where our money is going. No. You can literally go to transparency.aragon and see where all the payments have gone. If they had hired a contractor, how much amount was sent. I mean, this is revolutionary. Imagine a company like Microsoft having transparency.microsoft.com. Yeah, we just paid our shareholders this much. We paid our CEO this much. The whole thing would collapse, you know? They don't really want to show these things because once you see the value of trans, I mean, the transfer of value, things change. So Aragon for me is on how you can create organizations and the traditional method of creating a company on a blockchain. There are limitations though. Decentralization means that you are not tied to one single entity. So if I want to use Aragon, my problem is that I have to use it with Ethereum. I don't want to do that. What if I like something else? And I understand that that's the pathway they went down. That's OK. I hope in the future they have a plan to shift away from Ethereum and allow any blockchain to be used. I mean, They're yes. working on their own chain on Cosmos. They just announced it like a couple days ago. Oh, cool. I'm onto it then, huh? <laughs> there we go. Well, that's good to hear. And then you have other organizations uh, like uh, Hybrix. Hybrix is an entity in a, or organization in the Netherlands. And they have the platform Internet of Coin, which is one of the ways you can use Hybrix. But Hybrix itself is a way to communicate with multiple chains using the same language. It allows you to communicate between, let's say, Ethereum, uh, Monero, Bitcoin, uh, etc., in a way where you only have to communicate to one and the rest goes out. And these tools are coming up. So later, I hope to see platforms like Aragon, as you said, they're trying to bring that up. And that's great to hear. I want to see platforms that are not tied to one, uh, to one platform. The second one, for me, is quite interesting, is Decred. So Decred, I've been using it. I've been trying to learn about it. I got involved, uh, I heard about it from Noah in 2007, oh, 17, sorry. And uh, 
I found it quite fascinating at first, but I'm a very skeptical person. I've seen many projects. I've been involved since 2013. I've seen grand promises and little, little I guess, uh, offerings in return. So I kind of stayed in the background monitoring it, how they're developing it. The moment I got very interested is when Politio system came on board. So to just give you a background, Decred created a decentralized funding and governance system. This was implemented from the beginning. The limitation that I proposed before with Bitcoin was that it requires outside investors. Yes, you have the mining, uh, which you know, produces the coins, it goes to the miners. Apart from that, there's no funding allocation for further thought. It's not to say a limitation in design, but perhaps at that time it didn't make sense. Perhaps the designer did not understand that later in the future we can have distributed funding systems with multi-signature wallets and a community voting on them or smart contract-based allocation of such funds. So as we progress forward, we have to, I guess, review other systems and see what they offer. So Decred works in a 60-30-10 model. So 60% goes to the miners, 30% to the stakeholders, and 10% goes into a decentralized funding, uh, let's say, wallet uh, or fund, let's call it more correctly. No worries. Um, you can go on there and submit a proposal like DAO stack. So you can go on there and say, hey, I would like to do these things. You can vote on it. There's a lot of room for improvement. There's a lot of room to involve the correct people to vote on the certain proposals. Having a program or vote on a proposal that's got to do with public speaking or something else doesn't really make sense. Um, so there's ways to improve these systems. And there's ways to introduce, I guess, a better uh, a level of transparency and accountability. But these are great. So imagine, like, I just explained this to someone that has never been involved with cryptocurrencies. And I say, imagine, let's say, the Federal Reserve uh, after 2008 said, hey, guys, we need $16 trillion out of your money to bail out the banks. No one would do it. Who the fuck would sit there and go, yeah, sure, that sounds great. I'll let my grandparents pay off this debt that this bank let my grandparents pay off this debt that this bank has, like, created. No one would do it. So the point of a decentralized system, so that's the proposal system of Decred, uh, is to allow people to have a say that matter. So it's including people that are a part of that network. So if my tax money is going somewhere or if we're in a zone where we need to print more money, I need to be involved in that because it involves me. And if I don't know, I would like to have the ability to kind of like pass that decision to someone else. So tools like this are great to show people because they get the idea, wow, so you can have a decentralized funding system where you submit ideas, it gets funded, and you can implement it anywhere in the world. So you could be in a rural country. You can have just a simple internet connection and want to do something. I'm not saying it will pass. I'm not saying it's easy. Just go on there and do it. But I'm saying these tools exist, and they transform the way we kind of interact with each other. So governance as a whole acts like that. Privacy on top of that, I don't have much time to get into that aspect, but it all goes in hand in hand because once you have kind of people that have skin in the game, having a say on what is implemented, then you need to introduce privacy for those individuals in a way that still keeps their vote in a, uh, let's say, reputable manner without exposing their identity. And that, for me, is very important. Decred has had an attempt on this through their security protocol. There are other people attempting to do similar things. But at the, end of the, at the end of the day, reputation systems matter a lot because you can do that and avoid uh, exposing an individual uh, by using a very good system that has a reputation built into it. And platforms like Civic are doing a great job at that, and I do want to applaud what they're doing. And uh, there are many other protocols. So it soon it will become like, I need to build this. It will become like, I need to build this system, and you take pieces that are existing and put them together and it can have a very, very uh, interesting, I guess, uh, protocol project come out of it. And I hope to see that because at the end of the day, we mustn't forget Bitcoin was merely several protocols and, uh, let's say, you know, projects tied up into one. Uh, Innovative-wise, there wasn't a lot of things going on. But in terms of putting them together in the correct order, it created the whole world of people interested in uh, decentralization. Uh, I don't have much else to add to that, but I guess I would like to see decentralized governance and tools be implemented in emerging countries and other places. In India, for example, they have a centralized system which onboarded 1.1 billion people of the country, which is heavy, but they did it in a very, very intrusive ways, which is you're not going to receive your, let's say, uh, 
food coupon or you know your aid unless you register through this system so a lot of people were forced to register because they wanted to continue receiving services from the government or they were scared and they didn't know better and there's a lot of these comments online if you read through them so there must be better ways to do it without pushing people into it and you know the system 1.1 billion people's biometrics being held in one database i mean fuck me that um yeah I hope you enjoyed it. I guess it's like a bit more overall overview, but that's how I feel on this now, giving you some practical examples of what's going on. And uh, yeah, and actual physical examples of decentralization